Hi, everyone. Great to see you all. So this presentation is based on something that I've been writing about earlier this year. And I started writing about it because I was applying for a master's degree. And I was really struggling to find something which matched what I wanted specifically to talk about. I was trying to write about the internet. I've always been deeply in interested in how the internet works. And I was sat in Zofa Cafe. Probably some of you know Zofa Cafe. You visited there. I was sat there, and I was struggling away with the things I was reading. And so I just started looking around the room. And my eyes fell on a couple who were sat not so far from me. And the woman was celebrating her birthday, or ostensibly she seemed to be celebrating her birthday. She had a big birthday cake on the table between them. And what they were doing is they were taking photos. So the woman was casting all these really cute, coy poses over the top of the birthday cake. They weren't actually speaking to each other, though. At, uh, not, not once. There was some chit-chat about what the photo might look like, but they weren't talking to each other. And they, re they lit and relit the candles four times because they were blown out, but she wasn't satisfied with the picture. So they lit them again, and then they blew out the candles again. And at one point, they cut up the cake so that they could have cake-eating photos. And the guy, her, her, part, her boyfriend, he lifted the slice of cake to his mouth, but it was a little bit flimsy, so it fell. And he tried to catch it with his teeth, and it made him laugh. And it was a moment of genuine frivolity, and she caught it on the camera. And the second that she caught it on the camera, her face dropped back to her phone. And I watched as she edited the picture for Instagram. And this isn't the first time I've seen that. It's not the first time you've seen that. In any country, all over the world, we've all seen that. People preempting attitudes so that they can take a photo of them. And it just got me thinking about this question. Why can people be seen to simulate experiences so that they can take pictures of themselves having them? That appears to be one of the finest markers of being in a place these days. If you arrive at a tourist attraction or a trendy bar, you'll find that it's almost totally peopled by people who are preempting attitudes so that they can be photographed. This picture, it's a bit far back maybe for people to read. I'll read it out. It says, grounded private jet for hire helps Russians fake lavish lifestyles on Instagram. This is the most extreme version. It's the end of the spectrum of what I'm talking about. But it, this is a real private jet that you can climb into and take a photo of. You hire it out, and it's just purely for an Instagram photo. So I thought, ah, now this is a real cultural phenomena. This is something which I feel, as a 25-year-old woman, defines a lot of the places I'm visiting and a lot of the experiences I'm having. And it just so happily matched the cultural theorist I was reading about at that very moment. This very cool looking man is Robert Faller. He is an Australian philosopher and cultural theorist. He's the lesser known contemporary of Slava Žižek, if anyone's familiar with him. He's the less popular and slightly quieter friend of that guy. He was writing in the first decade of the, of the 2000s, mostly. But it was in the 90s that he started asking the following questions. Why do people record TV shows on VCR but never watch them? So at this point, VCR is a somewhat obsolete media to us. But at the time, he had this creeping sensation that people were maybe not being completely authentic about what it was that they were doing. The second question he asks is, why do they go to the library and photocopy text that they never read? I mean, it's difficult for us to imagine having to actually do that now, but at one point, you couldn't just save a tab at the top of your screen. You would have to go and find something you were interested in and photocopy it and then carry it home. But what he observed is that plenty of people were doing that and then never reading it as if the very act of them having photocopied it had sated their need to actually read it. So he came up with a theory called interpassivity. Here's his short definition of what it is, and I'll explain how he applies it to his examples. 
It is when the enjoyment of something is partly or even totally delegated to other people or to a technical device. So delegated in the sense that the person, the, the subject of the situation is not enjoying the first-hand experience for themselves. They are outsourcing it to another entity to have for them. In the same way that the boss at the top of a company will delegate responsibility down the line so that they don't have to complete the action, someone else can do it on their behalf. The reason that he called this theory into passivity, where enjoyment and pleasure is seen to be outsourced, the pleasure, for example, of reading, the pleasure, for example, of watching, he was comparing it specifically to interactivity which is a mode of cultural behavior which has defined really all of time from the Industrial Revolution onwards, where people outsource work to machines. The first time that we figured out that a machine could do our work for us, we've been outsourcing the responsibility. The difference he noticed, and he noticed it right in the 90s, was that people in this sort of our technologically supported age, they've started to outsource things they actually would like to do. The things that they can afford to be passive in doing, they're delegating that role to a machine or to something else. Now, the, the thing that really got me about this theory is that his examples don't illuminate it that well. And there's something incredibly eerie, and anyone who's watched Black Mirror will probably agree with this, when there's something that seems to preempt without even knowing the horrors that it's truly preempting, a certain reality that might once have happily played out in science fiction. In the same way, Fowler's theory matches the photography experience uh, combination better than it did his original theories, and that's what drew it to me so much. So I kept reading. And here, this was the quote that I found, and it took me a long time to find it because mostly he writes in German, and he's not as popular as Zizek. So some think Zizek has worked on this theory too, but in a way that, frankly, is far too complex for me. I couldn't understand what he was talking about. But here I found that Faller has designated what he calls a double delegation, a two-part outsourcing to interpassive behavior. The first one is that people transfer their pleasure to a representative agent, i.e. a thing, and secondly, they transfer the belief in the illusion that they have staged to an undefined, naive other. So we're going to take these two parts separately. So here, he clarifies part one, the delegation of pleasure to a representative agent, with this information. Rather than letting others, other people, animals, or machines, work in your place, interpassive behavior entails letting others consume in your place. So consumption here is synonymous with pleasure. For the couple that I witnessed in Zophar, they weren't seen by me or other people around to be engaging in traditional and protracted means of engagement. They weren't laughing with each other, they weren't talking to each other, they weren't actually looking at each other. What they were doing instead is they were preempting attitudes that made it look like all of those things had happened and they fed a petrified or frozen form into the camera. In that sense, it was the camera that consumed, not the people. So that was the, that's how the first part of Fowler's delegation really matches. But actually, that's by the by. That is secondary for our, for our real purposes here, because as we well know, those photos aren't just being taken for the sake of being photos. They're being taken for social media. And this is where it becomes incredibly interesting. Secondly, they transfer the belief in the illusion that they have staged to an undefined, naive other. The first part that I'd like to change about this statement, actually, is this idea of illusion. So obviously it's going to need a little bit of tampering so that it will fit perfectly what I want to say, and maybe not perfectly, as you may well tell me afterwards. But the, f the part about it being illusion is not quite right. The reason for that is that if this were to be an illusion, it would mean that traditionally protracted forms of engagement, laughing and talking, would have to be deemed the only reality for its alternative to be a an illusion. Now, it was happening right in front of me. 
It was real. It was reality. The fact that it's staged is known to all of us. It's a happy open secret when we look at Instagram that most of the photos we're looking at are staged. That's not really so much the problem. The interesting part is whether it is meaningful. Because it is meaningful, because we understand it, we can interpret it. So why should it be meaningful? Why should we be able to appreciate what is happening when we look at these photos and we understand the, the communication that people are trying to have about this is the experience I had? The reason is, I think, tied up in this idea of the undefined, naive other. The photo is merely a means to an end. The other is essential if anybody is going to understand the self. The other is an abstract idea, but it comprises of all the people you've ever spoken to, all the media you've ever read, all the things you've ever learned. They are all the things, not you, all the things, not yourself. If a baby is born and fed and taught to read, but it grows up in solitary confinement, it will struggle as a human. This is just an, this is a, is open to be contested. But they struggle to find the same sense of selfhood. A person is who they are because of the conflict they come into with other people. I know who I am because I'm not you. And you know who you are because I'm not me. On a micro basis, that happens every single day. Now, we've entered a new and unprecedented stage in human history where the other is not contained in the world that happens when you wake up and walk out of your house and interact with people or interact with people over breakfast. It's contained in your pocket all the time. You have access to all the human beings in the world at the same time and never. You have access to everyone and no one. They're all... Sorry, John, I've just dropped your thing. And the batteries come out. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Here's, the, here's this part. Oh, cheers, Les, thank you. So, where was I at there with the other? Oh, thank you. So, the other is contained everywhere and nowhere. And you are in a constant nagging proximity to it all the time. Now, it has an extreme power to affect your sense of selfhood. A great example of this is when you're at a concert and you're trying to look at the artist on stage, but what is happening in front of you all the way up to the side of the stage is that people are watching what's on stage through the screen of their camera phone. Why are they doing that? Why are they doing something where they're not going to watch that on YouTube? They don't watch any band. Who, who goes on YouTube and wants to see a live performance filmed by someone else of a band that they like? Nobody wants to do that. The reason I believe that people do that is because they are being deferent to their online other, which pervades the experience they're having at any given time. People find it reasonable. Lots of people. I've done it. We've all done it. Some people do it to great extremes. And some people do it a little bit, but we're all vulnerable to this. Subjugating your, the experience you're living right now to something online which appears larger. So the problem, the, the large problem that I'm really worried about is teenagers. Now, I'm already 25, and I was born in 1994. And I remember a time without the internet. And I remember growing a selfhood. I mean, I was still on MSN, you know, like lots of us were. But I remember growing a selfhood before Instagram. Now, I teach young girls. And I'm sure lots of you in this room also teach young girls. And it concerns me deeply that they are not being given the chance to cultivate their own selfhood before they log on to Instagram. I have students who are young girls who are 12, 11, 13, who are using Instagram and are understanding their sense of self through this enormous lens of the online other, which shows them what they should look like. And there's been some brilliant presentations tonight that have already drawn, uh, drawn a parallel with this because it is exactly the era that we're heading into that we are defined by the internet. 
And I think it's really important to resist it now. This habit of preempting situations to take photos of them before you've had the real situation. If we catch ourselves doing that, we should maybe just stop and have a little think. A teenager hasn't grown into him or herself yet. It does inordinately affect women, it seems to be. The rates, I have a statistic here, in fact. This is what I'm going to sum up with. The Guardian, a, couple of, a few months ago, they released a study by the Millennium Cohort Study in which 11,000 14-year-old girls from the UK took part in answering, and they found that 40% of girls who spend more than five hours a day on social media show symptoms of depression. What is a symptom of depression in a girl that young? They didn't explain that exactly. Those symptoms are existing in a way they've never existed before, and I believe it's because selfhood is not being able to flourish against people so young. And I leave you with this photo here, which I found on the internet, which is a picture of an artwork done by this Russian artist. And it's, it's important. I don't know about whether it's a good art piece particularly. I, I, I mean, it might be, but I'm not, I'm not casting dispersions on that. I found it on the internet because it's the first time I've seen interpassivity and phone use being tied. There might be way more. I can spend lots more hours searching for it. But this is, this is the first one I found. And I think that the parallel is really, really key. And the question I'd like to leave you guys with is whether if you have children already or if you're planning to have children in the future, even if you plan on being a liberal parent, as I do, will you stop your young children going on social media when they're 11, when they're 12, even though it might be normal, so that they're not constantly buffeted with images of who they're supposed to be before they know who they are? And yeah, I always thought I'd be so liberal, and I'm not sure whether I wouldn't just stop my children doing that. But I think it's something that we all think about as we move into this terrifying world. Thank you. Oh my gosh, one more big round of applause for Mr. Allegra Scales, please. Beautiful Allegra, thank you.